Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Voices from Afar. And I am your host, Bill Demarest. And tonight we have a very special guest, Nisha Whiteley, speak about her book. And since John Daisley is a friend of hers, and they are both in Austin, I'm going to turn it over to John in a moment. But being that we are Truth Frequency Radio and the subject is cannabis, I have a full studio. Star is with me, Claire is with me, and Joy is with me, and I'm sure anyone else that saw the banner on Nisha's appearance on tonight's show uh, will be tuned in. So, John, I pass it to you. Thank you, sir. Nisha, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Success. Yeah. What's up? Well, hell yeah, from Texas, (laughs) y'all. I just had to get everyone's heart rate up before we got started. (laughs) And you did that. You did that, my dear. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Let me me introduce our guest. I met this young lady in one of the tiniest honky-tonks possibly in the world. Knows about Ginny's Little Longhorn in Austin, Texas. And that's where I met this lovely lady and became friends with her years ago. And it's just been a pleasure to call her a friend because she's one of the nicest people you could ever meet. Nisha, we're here tonight to talk about your book and the subject of your book, which is the the power of marijuana or cannabis to to help relieve chronic illness and chronic pain. I don't think I need to be saying any more at this at this point. I'll let you I'll let you jump in and say a few words, dear. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be invited onto the show and to talk about one of my favorite topics, cannabis. I, I guess you were expecting a rounding <laughs> cheer of applause. Yeah. And I figured Claire might jump in right now, but yes, dear, continue. Sorry, Nisha, they're all stoned. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, so in October of 2016, we released the book Chronic Relief, A Guide to Cannabis for the Terminally and Chronically Ill. And what I'm trying to do with the, the book is to bridge the gap between the vast amount of science that exists on this incredibly benevolent plant and how it works in our body and practical use. My mother utilized cannabis at the end of her battle with lung cancer. And what we were really looking for was something that would give her uh, relief from the nausea and the vomiting. The nausea and the vomiting was a side effect of the opiates, which were intended to help address pain and a whole host of other side effects that she was having. And then also address things that were just as a result of the the cancer itself. And so for us, had it just addressed the nausea and the vomiting, that would have been a win. But frankly, it blew us away at how effective it was for treating her neuropathic pain, which pharmaceuticals couldn't touch. And it reduced her anxiety. It gave her appetite back, you know, and it really made it possible for my mother to be present the last three weeks of her life, which was an extraordinary gift to not only our family, but everybody that came to pay their respects and for my mom. So, you know, instead of being completely incapacitated and not being lucid, my mom had this three-week love fest farewell goodbye, and it was really cathartic for everyone involved. And at the time, we were very hush-hush about the fact that my mom had utilized cannabis. Somewhere along the way, it really dawned on me that this is an incredible medicine, and I I felt like more people needed to know that. And so I was going to put together a recipe book for people who didn't want to smoke their medicine. And at the time, I thought that brownies probably weren't the very best delivery mechanism for somebody who is trying to change disease progression. So I was going to put together this cookbook. And And decided that cookbook needed an introduction. And five years later, we have the book Chronic Relief, A Guide to (laughs) Cannabis for the Terminally and Chronically Ill. And I realized that so much of what I thought was true about cannabis is, in fact, not true. And that this is an incredibly safe, effective medicine. 
And so what we're trying to do with the book and with our website, which is mychronicrelief.com, is simply to help educate people. That's really what we're going for. So let me just jump in there, Nisha. Obviously, you you went through quite a a unique experience with your mum, I think it's fair to say. I I, I can't imagine how, how that would have been to, you know, to experience that. But I think a lot of us nowadays know and have known for quite some time, actually, that what we've been fed all our lives, information about things like cannabis, to mention one, I mean, the list is endless. And I think we, we, we're all pretty aware of just how much truth the governments throughout the world tell their people. Um, it's a very sad affair. Now, here, we, we spoke about this earlier today. Uh if ever if ever there was an advert for the benefit cannabis or smoking marijuana coming from Texas, the both of us, we only have to say <laughs> Willie Nelson. The guy is going to be eighty four years old at the end of next month, and he's probably smoked weed every day of his life for the past seventy years. And you look at him, he's like one of the most talented people that's ever lived. He's certainly one of the most loved entertainers that's ever lived. And he's just a legend. And there you go. What harm did weed ever do, Willie? Eh? None that I'm aware of. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the only harm, really, that cannabis has done him is uh, potentially left him with a bit of a smoker's cough. And <laughs> it's my oh, God understanding. Help him, eh? <laughs> it's my understanding that um, his doctor advised him to move to a vaporizer, and he has done that. Here he is at 84, yeah. going strong. He's a prolific writer and entertainer and in full control of his faculties. And so Here, I, just, I, think- I just made this little ditty up. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be junkies. Don't let them smoke reefers and puff that old weed. Let them be like Willie indeed. But um, but um, I'll need to work on that, but it just popped into my head. <laughs> I think you're on a good track there, John. <laughs> yeah, but, Nisha, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, Bill. Uh, yeah, Nisha, we were talking earlier, and I mentioned my very good friend, Mike. Uh, He has survived throat cancer and colon cancer and has long black hair. He's had five radiation treatments, didn't lose his hair, and he's now cancer-free. Now, my friend Mike is a habitual smoker. First thing in the morning, he goes outside and he smokes so that he can breathe and smokes throughout the day. It's got to be simple evidence that smoking is helpful or not, or is that a misnomer? Well, you bring up a very interesting point. I think most of us would automatically assume that, you know, maybe smoking isn't the best delivery mechanism for cannabis. However, the research that has been done, this is going to blow your mind, that when we look at the cross-section of society and ask the question, who is most uh, at risk for lung cancer? Everyone knows that that people who smoke cigarettes, tobacco, are most at risk for lung cancer. Well, then conventional wisdom would tell us that the second probably most at-risk group of society would be people who smoke cannabis and tobacco. Well, that's not true. What the science shows us is that cannabis smokers, chronic meaning Daily cannabis smokers are the least likely group to actually get lung cancer. Of course, the most likely group is tobacco smokers. Um, And then followed by non-smokers, then followed by those who are chronic cannabis and tobacco smokers. So that really flies in the face of conventional wisdom, but the science is clear. And anybody who wants to know more information about that can look up Dr. Donald Tashkin's work. And we have a video presentation of that research is available on our website. And we also write about it in the book. But Dr. Tashkin was actually hired by uh, NIDA to do some research, NIDA, the National Institute Against Drug Abuse. And he 
was not able to prove what NIDA was wanting him to prove. And what they were looking for was to prove that cannabis causes throat, neck, lung cancers. And, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into why cannabis is not, there's, there's no evidence that cannabis causes lung cancer or throat cancer. What they found is that there happened to be uh, lung uh, killing pathogens in the cannabis plant. And so for a lot of folks, the cannabis is providing a protective effect. Now, do we need more science? Sure. But what we see at this point is that people who are chronic cannabis smokers have the lowest risk for lung cancer. We've all heard this. These politicians have been telling us for years, marijuana, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, is a gateway drug, you know, <laughs> leads to all the bad stuff. Um, right. I know, I know from personal experience it's not. But a couple of years ago, I was, fin- I was finally able to kick the habit of, of something that I guess I guess addicted is the right word to use. I'd been consuming this stuff all my life, and that is damn soda, as you call it here, soda pop. I finally got off that a couple of years ago, and by God, what a difference that made in my life. But you never hear all these Muppets in the government warning people about the dangers of that. And, of course, we all know what that does to people and yet every time I'm in the supermarket like I was earlier today you see these women with their wee children and what's what's in the shopping cart sodas and all these crappy foods that they buy it just does my nothing so Nisha do you do you agree with me that uh, cannabis marijuana hemp could cure all the ills of mankind as well as plastics clothing, just everything, building material, and, and all of the products I mentioned, everything from paper, plastics, oils, healing. I just, I want to fume, and I do fume when I think about these SOBs that are running this world, keeping it from us. You did mention in one of your, your presentations, how much marijuana would it take for a person to OD? <laughs> I cracked up. <laughs> Okay, well, we don't know how much cannabis it would take for somebody to OD. There is no known lethal dose. Uh, Dr. Donald Abrams, a highly respected uh, MD who specializes in uh, oncology and AIDS patients, he says that it is um, estimated that it could potentially take 800 cigarettes consume cannabis 800 joints consumed in 15 minutes but i'm not sure that that is humanly possible so the truth is that we just really don't know but what we do know is that in the 5000 plus years that human beings have been using this plant as medicine there is no known recorded death we have over a thousand people a year in the United States die as a result of complications with aspirin. Um, so, you know, conceivably, we can say that cannabis is safer than aspirin. To answer your question earlier about can cannabis solve all of man's ills, I don't know the answer to that, but it can certainly solve a lot of them. As you said, it can provide food, fuel, fiber, industrial products. It can be used safely as an intoxicant. And most importantly, it is a safe, versatile, and effective medicine. Um, So, yes, the hemp plant, whether we're talking about the industrial hemp plant or we're talking about the medicinal cannabis plant, uh, they have a lot to offer humanity and a lot to offer you know, legalization has a lot to offer us from an economic standpoint, uh, can, can considerably improve the way our judicial system works, especially when we're not running people through our uh, system that got caught for a single joint. You know, and I'll use Texas as an example. So in the state of Texas, we spend over $730 million a year arresting, booking, and processing 
people for cannabis charges. The vast majority of those people, something like more than 80%, are for small amounts of possession. You know, what if we were spending that $730 million on something like education or innovation? How would that impact our economy? And what would happen if we actually had a legal regulated market where patients have safe access where education, uh, we have real education about the plant and how it interacts with the body. And then what's going to happen when American farmers actually are able to grow industrial hemp and have outdoor cannabis gardens? The, the net impact to society is going to be huge. Well, can I just make a point there, Nisha? Uh, there's, there's an outfit that we're all familiar with is anticipating this, I think is the right way of putting it. And, uh, of course, I'm talking about the horrible people at Monsanto. They, they're they doing their damnness to create a synthetic form of hemp, marijuana. Uh, your thoughts on that, please? Do you mean that Monsanto is trying to create synthetic cannabinoids for the medicinal market? I couldn't be specific. I'd, I'd need to go back and check it out. But just, just the mere fact... That they've got to get their fingers into the pie. That's enough to scare the bejesus out of me. Well, rightfully so. There are a lot of people who share your sentiment. Big agriculture, big pharma, you know, they are all going to want to get into this market because cannabis and hemp are going to be in industry disruptors. Uh, you know, we've already seen it in Colorado where they have the um, adult access. You know, beer sales ha have dropped. So a lot of these companies that have been doing quite well in the United States in the past are, are nervous about cannabis becoming legal across the country. And many of them are going to invest. They're already investing. They're already wanting to be a part. And there's going to be a great deal of transition and change in the next 10 to 15 years in the marketplace as a result. And there, there will be a lot of people who have made significant sums of money and some who are going to be left out. I hope that there is enough opportunity for everyone and that, you know, the little guys, be they farmers, growers, um, small dispensaries, you know, whatever manufacturers of uh, cannabis therapeutics, I'm hoping that, that there will be a great deal of success for the small business person. But unfortunately, some of them will probably be snuffed out, which is sad. Yeah. That how, that how, as a matter of interest, how is it progressing through the Texas legislature at the moment? Well, um, Texas has several bills on the books, um, not nearly as good as the bill we had during our last legislative session, which would have made uh, cannabis legal for adult use and for medical use. But what we have on the books is a decriminalization bill. It actually received a hearing last Monday and will ultimately, we anticipate, will be voted out of committee. And we expect that the calendars committee who schedules uh, what the House floor hears, we anticipate that they will schedule it and that it will be voted on um, by the House. Not sure if the Senate is going to do the same thing or not. Then we have our medical cannabis bill, and it's a strong bill. It allows the patient and the doctor to decide together um, how much THC or CBD or what the cannabinoid ratios should be for that particular patient. It is very well written bill, and it also would allow for home grow for the patients, which Cannabis advocates such as myself are extremely pleased about that. Um, 
we are concerned we may not get hearings for that. So if you are a Texan and listening to this, please let your elected officials know that you want the medical cannabis bills to receive hearings. And we're back with one of the happiest subjects that I think anybody can talk about. But I am fuming that the elites are keeping the answer from us. And my solution is... Screw them. Grow it in your backyard. Grow it in your front yard. Put it in medians. Put it all over expressways. The thing is, we overwhelm them with the weed. There's no way that they can keep up with the weed that's growing as much as we want it. So, tomorrow, start planting your seeds. Oh, <laughs> Nisha, you, you were going into the gateway drug fallacy. We all know it's not true, but what are your statistics on that fact? Well, in 2013, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which is the largest government report available, showed that over 115 million Americans reporting having tried cannabis, yet only 24.6 million reported using it in the month prior to the survey. That same survey also showed that 37 million Americans admitted to using cocaine, but only 1.5 reported use in the prior month, and then less than 5 million reported using heroin in their lifetime, and fewer than 300,000 Americans had reported using it in the prior month. And so if it were true, which it is not, If it were true that cannabis were a gateway drug, we would have a much higher rate of hard drug use. So for me, that argument does not hold water. And, you know, you hear a lot of talk from fear-mongering organizations that, oh, cannabis is addictive. It might be true for an incredibly small percentage of the population, but it's an incredibly small percentage of the population. You know, just to put that into context, cannabis is less addictive than caffeine, and I don't see anyone trying to outlaw caffeine. No, of course not. And as you so, say, you know, if it was addictive, we'd all be addicts. I can't remember the last time I had a, a talk on a, on a joint. I really can't. It, it's not a matter of being addictive. It's, it's like ice cream. It's like anything that is pleasurable and you can't overdose on it. And it's just such a good thing. It doesn't make you an addict because you want to smoke it all the time. I used to be habitual, but where I work now, I can't be habitual. But yeah, to call it an addiction, no. It just, well, that's like calling sex or masturbation an addiction. It's just so good. Well, I think it's important for people to understand how cannabis works in the human body. And I I think the missing piece for a lot of people is, is this. Cannabis is the most pharmacologically active plant on the planet and one of the safest. So two of its primary classes of chemicals, therapeutically active chemicals, are cannabinoids and terpenes. So cannabinoids actually mimic chemicals that our body produces that are required for our health. Those are called endocannabinoids or cannabinoids within. And so it was through the the research done by Dr. Raphael Meshulam, an Israeli scientist, that we were able to figure out how does THC work in the brain? And once once they figured that out, it started to unravel so much more. And we found out that our bodies have something called the endocannabinoid system. So beyond these chemicals that mimic those in the cannabis plant, we have receptors and we have these enzymes. And there's this entire network that exists in every single part of the body that its sole responsibility is to always bring us back to a state of health 
to homeostasis, to balance. And so when that system is not able to bring us back into a state of balance for whatever reason, stress, injury, uh, bacteria, virus, or chronic illness, then phytocannabinoids, those from the cannabis plant, they can help the body move back closer to the state of balance so it can do for itself what it needs to do, which is to heal. And this is the core reason why cannabis is such a safe and effective medicine. And to take it one step further, we do not have receptors, cannabinoid receptors, meaning receptors throughout the body that are activated by chemicals of the cannabis plant. We don't have enough of those in the part of the brain that control heartbeat or breathing for it to be lethal uh, with just regular safe use. And so that's not the case with opiates. And as all of you know, we have a very serious opiate crisis in this country. And a lot of First of all, doctors are, in fact, over-prescribing opiates. There's little to no research that shows that using opiates for chronic pain are effective. Now, using opiates for acute pain, absolutely, there's research on that. And a lot of people in, in emergency medicine require opiates to help manage a patient's pain. But beyond two weeks, we really need to be looking at, at other alternatives. And so a lot of people who are in pain will think, oh, well, if a little lid is good, then a little more is probably better. Or they take what they were prescribed and they take it with alcohol or another drug that they didn't know would, would have a problem, an interaction. And those folks never wake up. And that's not the risk, never the case with cannabis. Um, and in fact, comparatively speaking, cannabis is what we would consider to be a low toxicity medicine, whereas chemo and opiates are high toxicity medicines. And chemo especially because when someone goes through chemo, they can have permanent changes to their, to their body. Whereas when cannabis leaves someone's system, it's left their system and their body is restored to however it was before they took the cannabis or their body is in a better condition than it was before they took the cannabis. And I was going to ask about, I saw a bit on YouTube um, from yourself, your talk, talking about the pain and the inflammation and the oxidation. I was wondering if you could tell the listeners a bit more about that because I'm very interested in what you had to say on how doctors are not really putting all these things together as a whole to look at people's pain management and things like that. Thank you for the question. So I'm going to go back to the endocannabinoid system for just a moment. So this endocannabinoid system, as I said a minute ago, is really designed to always bring us back to a point of homeostasis, right? And this system plays a major role, regulates or modulates every biological function in our body. We're talking about pain management, inflammation, neuroprotection, even suckling in a newborn. So this, it cannot be understated or overstated, excuse me, how important the endocannabinoid system is to the body. And so what we tried to do in the book uh, was to really look at what are the common denominators of most illness, right? And it's much easier to address that than to go through and explain how cannabis might be beneficial to every single disease or ailment or injury. And so we really looked at pain, inflammation, and oxidation. And cannabinoids help address all of those things because they are working with our endocannabinoid system to ensure that those chemicals are being used in our bodies for the highest, best, and most immediate use. So when someone is utilizing cannabis to help manage pain, some people, especially if they're using vaporization or if they're 
inhaling, they may actually receive pain relief almost instantaneously because the cannabinoids are then crossing the blood-brain barrier immediately. Now, if somebody's needing sustained relief, then they may choose a different intake method, such as a tincture or a spray or some type of an edible or a patch. But the same is true with inflammation as well. So, you know, you think about it. What are inflammatory diseases? Well, of course, we think of probably rheumatoid arthritis as a natural, but very few people would consider Alzheimer's as an inflammatory disease, but it is. And so cannabis is always working in the body to help manage inflammation, pain, and oxidation. But for those of you who are listening who your primary issue is pain, I do want to point out that Sometimes cannabis can be what we call biphasic, which means that in a low dose, it is highly effective. But at a higher dose, it actually could exacerbate the problem or make it worse. So it's it's important for each patient to be able to figure out, well, what's my therapeutic dose? And that's one of the things that we really tried to do in the book was to give people a jumping off point to figure that out because we don't have a whole lot of information really yet about what's the right dose for someone with neuropathic pain versus someone with acute pain or what's the right starting dose and cannabinoid profile for someone with Alzheimer's versus someone with Parkinson's versus with somebody who has cancer or Lyme disease. And then, you know, the next question is what's the real difference in terms of dosing uh, when you're trying to address a symptom versus changing disease progression. But regardless of what your primary goal is, oftentimes cannabis can be very effective when used properly. You said that cannabis could possibly help 120 million Americans, correct? You know, I, I, I believe that. I did some research about how many Americans I thought could benefit. And, you know, when you look at 100 million adult Americans report having chronic pain, 2.58 million with diabetes, 16.3 million with heart disease, 11.9 million with cancer, 7.7 million with PTSD. Are you depressed yet? Uh, And 7 million who have suffered a stroke Each one of those diseases that I just mentioned, the vast majority of the people who suffer from those ailments could potentially find benefit from cannabis. And, you know, I I don't want to sound like a snake oil salesman that it's a cure-all and it's going to heal you and make you perfect and whole overnight, but it is a a treasure trove of healing, that those are words by Raphael Meshulam, the great Israeli scientist, and it helps us in many, many ways. It helps us live better, age more gracefully, and can help give people the kind of relief that they need to live better and die more, more peacefully and with more dignity. Have you seen the uh, Run from the Cure, the Rick Simpson story? I'm very familiar with the Rick Simpson story. Yes. Uh, he had testimonies that they would not let him speak of. What, what I was, one of the things is I was going to say is I put Run from the Cure up on my channel, and they would not let it go worldwide because there's a Louis Armstrong song in it. So I cut the Louis Armstrong song out of the video and they kept coming back at me for Was copyright. This YouTube? Yes. Uh, they, they kept coming at me for three times. I told them I do not have the song in the video. It's been <laughs> cut out because they said it was at like uh, one hour and 14 minutes and 27 seconds. And I did it in two parts and I cut out the Louis Armstrong. So I battled with them for from three different copyright owners on this song. And I finally got through to them. 
And my final uh, say to them is you cannot judge a YouTube video by its title because that because of that title, they knew Louis Armstrong was in there and they kept coming at me. It really is a censorship ship of uh, healing. Well, this this will set your hair on fire. Um, <laughs> we had an incredibly robust channel, the My Chronic Relief YouTube channel. We also had quite a bit of, um, not quite a bit, we had some original content on there. And everything that we had posted was science-based information, most of which was was being delivered by research scientists and uh, both PhDs and MDs. And they took our site down with no notice and no inquiry, and we were not able to recover any of that content. So for that reason, we now use Vimeo instead. They also... Um, canceled our Google Plus uh, channel. In your uh, research, um, did you find anything else that can stimulate the echinoid system as much as cannabis along your way at all? Anything? Excellent question. So <laughs> as much as cannabis, I don't know. So my research has really all been on cannabis and how it works with the human body. And there is a wonderful physician and researcher out there by the name of Dr. Ethan Russo. He is our country's foremost medical cannabis expert and one of the top in the world. And I'm incredibly blessed that he agreed to serve as um, one of my medical editors on the book. And he also wrote the forward to my book. And he's doing some fascinating research on, I want to say, 17 different medicinal plants that also stimulate the endocannabinoid system. So echinacea is one of those. You can actually um, look up some of his work at phytex.com. That's P-H-Y-T-E-C-S.com. They've got a list of the plants that they're currently researching. So it's all plant-based and it's all, all plants. There's nothing like there's no other like caffeine or anything stimulant at all other than plants. It's mainly plant-based is that, that he's working on as well, do you think? That That's correct. His work is yeah. plant-based, yes. Yeah. Now, there are an incredible number of cannabis-related products that are coming out of the marketplace. There's an, a lot of invention that's currently taking place. Uh, people are using all different types of products. For instance, one of my favorite products is by a group out of Oregon called City Tonics, and that's S-I-D-D-H-I Tonics. Dot com. Anyway, they they manufacture an Ayurvedic product, all plant based, and they're using cannabinoids from the plant and then terpenes, which we really haven't had a chance to discuss much. But terpenes mm. are what give cannabis and all other plants their smell. They're considered to be safe by the FDA, and it is the largest class of chemicals that exist in the plant world with something like 20,000 of them that have been identified. But terpenes are also therapeutic. And when you, you combine cannabinoids and terpenes together, it creates something that we call the entourage effect, which means they are all stronger together than any one of them are on their own. So it's really kind of the difference of a solo artist, um, may make great music, but it's hard to deny that a symphony makes much richer music, more complex music. So the same is true when we're adding all the, the components of the cannabis plant into cannabis products, and then you can also add them to many different 
types of herbs or other products. Now, some folks are adding caffeine. There are cannabis energy drinks. Um, some are closer to nature than others, but uh, there's a product out there for just about everyone. It, it seems to me like, you know, the, the basics, you have to have oxygen. You can't go for more than a few minutes without oxygen or water. You can't go for more than like three days without water and you can't go 10 days without food. It seems like of the, the basic necessities of mankind, they've kept one of the most important away from us. Now, I've gone years without cannabis and I didn't die, but you know what I'm saying? It, it's one of the basics on this planet that they've stolen from us and they're doing a damn good job of it. Well, and we'll have a relationship with as well. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, if I knew when my mother was diagnosed with cancer, what I know today, there is a very high likelihood that my mother would still be alive. And if she weren't still alive, she would have likely lived longer with much greater quality of life than what she did. So, you know, this plant really offers so much to the greater good, to improving public health. We're not talking about the whole world getting stoned out of their gourd and, you know, turning into Cheech and Chong. This is a misconception. You know, I even profile a gentleman in my book who for many, many years was taking copious quantities of pharmaceuticals, which all made his life worse. They made his pain worse. And um, he discovered cannabis because a family friend knew that his marriage was on the rocks and his job was on the rocks and his relationship with his children. They were all on the rocks. And he took a quarter bite of a brownie. This is a man who was unable to actually sit down on the toilet by himself. He had to have assistance to get up and down. And so he has a bite of brownie, is very cautious about it, lays down on his bed and realizes, hey, I need to go to the bathroom. Realizes when he's halfway down the hall that he got up out of bed and walked himself to the bathroom and said he just sat and cried because he realized for the first time in probably 15 years he wasn't in excruciating pain and that he didn't have to have help to get where he was trying to go. And so, you know, for a lot of people, this plant could be transformative. And it's time, really, that we bring science to the forefront of our conversation about cannabis and dissolve the, the cloud of shame, secrecy, and controversy around this very safe and highly effective medicine. And we're coming up to the close of the first hour, and I did want to uh, mention that people who have chemotherapy don't live as long or survive as long as those that refuse Oh, radiation. Anyway, Nisha, where can we find your book and tell us where we can find it? Well, thank you for that. It's uh, available on Amazon. You can also find it at my website, mychronicrelief.com. And that's M-Y-C-H-R-O-N-I-C-R-E-L. IEF.com. Uh, we just released the Kindle version over the weekend, so it's available in paperback and on Kindle. And yes, I will put your website in the archive, so anyone that goes to the archive will get a chance to go to your site. Anisha, thank you so very much for coming on the show, Voices from Afar. 